coming up on Space Time. Solving the 60-year-old mystery of quasars, discovery of an embryonic exoplanet in a distant star system, and Japan fails in its attempt to land on the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers believe they may finally have solved the mystery of some of the most powerful objects in the universe, quasars. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, show that galactic collisions are pivotal in the creation of quasars. First discovered some 60 years ago, quasars, or quasi-stellar objects as they were called, can shine as brightly as a trillion stars, packed into an area no larger than our solar system. They're like beacons in the dark, shining brightly from the far side of the universe, able to be seen more than 13 billion light years away. And that makes quasars among the most distant objects ever observed. Astronomers know they're generated by feeding supermassive black holes. It's the only thing powerful enough to create them. But until now, the exact trigger for such a powerful event has remained a mystery. But by observing 48 galaxies that host quasars and then comparing them to over 100 non-quasar galaxies, scientists discovered that the phenomenon is created by galaxies colliding. It's the first time that a sample of quasars of this size has been imaged with this level of sensitivity. The study's authors were able to determine that galaxies hosting quasars were some three times as likely to interact or collide with other galaxies. Most, if not all, galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centres. And they also contain substantial amounts of gas. But most of the time, the gas is orbiting at large distances from the galactic centre, out of the reach of the black holes. However, when two galaxies collide, gravitational forces push huge amounts of gas towards the supermassive black holes at the centre of the remnant galaxy system created from the collision. And this forms an accretion disk around the black hole, where matter is crushed and torn apart in the process of releasing huge amounts of energy before eventually passing beyond the event horizon, a sort of point of no return, beyond which matter falls forever towards the black hole's singularity. The energy released by material ripped apart spans the entire electromagnetic spectrum and results in quasars shooting out into deep space. The galactic collisions were discovered when researchers using deep imaging observations from the Isaac Newton telescope in La Palma observed the presence of distorted structures in the outer regions of galaxies that are home to quasars. The ignition of a quasar can have dramatic consequences for the entire galaxy. It can trigger star formation in nearby gas clouds, but it can also drive gas out of the galaxy, preventing it from forming new stars for billions of years. The studies provided astronomers with a significant step forward in their understanding of how these powerful objects are triggered and fueled. One of the study's authors, Clive Ted Hunter from the University of Sheffield, says quasars are one of the most extreme phenomena in the universe, and what astronomers are seeing in these events is likely to also represent the future for our own galaxy, the Milky Way, when it collides with the much larger Andromeda galaxy in about four or five billion years from now. This is Space Time. Still to come, discovery of an embryonic exoplanet in a distant star system, and Japan fails in its attempt to land a spacecraft on the moon. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet in the process of forming in the protoplanetary disk around a distant newly formed star. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, show this newly created embryonic world forming in the outskirts of a star system known as HD 169142, located some 350 light years away. The images were captured by the Sphere instrument on the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, the VLT, located in Chile. 
The study's lead author, Ian Hammond from Monash University, says the telescope's near-infrared capabilities allow the detection of this planet some 37 astronomical units out from the host star. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Sun and the Earth, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. And that puts this exoplanet slightly further out from its star than the orbit of Neptune is from the Sun. Astronomers expect planets to be hot during their formation. Hammond says the discovery represents a confirmation of a previous observation, suggesting the possibility of an exoplanet forming at that location. He says the new study confirms the hypothesis through both reanalysis of the existing data and also using their own work, which provided better observational quality. So far, only two other exoplanets have been imaged during their formation, PDS 70 D and C, both of which were in the PDS 70 star system. And so this latest discovery of HD 169142 b pushes that number up to three. The authors also found that the planet had been carving out a gap in the protoplanetary disk as it attracted material from the disk. Hammond says the near-infrared images show a spiral arm being excited in the disk by the planet, which strongly suggests that other protoplanetary disks that contain similar spirals may also be harbouring newly forming planets. This new protoplanet was found orbiting uh, a star in a protoplanetary disk. So this star, HD 169142, located in Sagittarius and has this large disk of gas and dust surrounding it, which we believe to be the birthplace of planets. And we have previously found two planets in another system by finding them as they're forming. We used data from the Very Large Telescope in Chile to observe the system HD169142 in the near-infrared uh, because we were searching for planets as they're forming so it would be quite hot so they should be near-infrared wavelengths so they should be quite bright and basically what we found in three separate observations we found this bright near-infrared signal inside the protoplanetary disk around HD169142 located about 37 astronomical units and it's also slightly larger than the mass of Jupiter. So say you to take Jupiter maybe double its size. What do we know about the host star? Uh, so the host star is it's quite different from our sun. It's roughly about 1.8 times its size. So this is it's quite a large and quite a bright star. So what, a white star? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not on the main sequence yet. So this is sort of a, a, a star that has essentially formed and, and started burning hydrogen, but it's still in uh, phase where it's only about 6 million years old. Uh, so it still has a lot of you know, material orbiting it that was sort of used to form this solar system. Yeah, so one of the reasons that we want to observe planets as they're in the middle of their formation is we want to understand exactly well, how planets form because we still don't quite exactly know. And there's essentially two main theories for how planets can form. So one of them is that everything um, sort of starts as small, what we call dust grains, so like grains of like silicates, you know, rocks and metal. And they start off very, very small. And in the protoplanetary disk phase, all these small grains gradually collide with each other and sort of stick together and eventually grow into, into larger and larger bodies until eventually forming what's called planetesimals, which we still have some left over in the, in the solar system as asteroids. But then these planetesimals can keep growing into planets and the fully formed planets like Earth. And then the other way that this could happen, or oh, the other way we could get planets, is through a process called gravitational instability, which is where the gas in the protoplanetary disk sort of collapses to form a large gaseous planet. So there's sort of two main ways to make planets. The sort of the problem that we have at the moment in our field is that planets are formed very, very quickly. So the process of core accretion, where small grains gradually grow into larger and larger bodies to form a planet, takes many millions of years, perhaps more than 10 million years. But we're finding planets that have already roughly formed several times the mass of Jupiter after only a few million years. So this sort of implies that perhaps planets are already forming as the molecular cloud is collapsing to form this new form of solar system. So this is kind of the question that we're, we're trying to answer. One of the big problems, I guess, is also the one metre barrier, isn't it, with the accretion theory from observations by astronauts aboard the International Space Station watching grains of sugar or salt suddenly coagulate together in microgravity, that we can understand how this thing gets started and these grains come together through electrostatic traction. But then they reach about a metre in size and they usually start to either fall back towards the star or they uh, break apart again. 
So we've still got this meter barrier to get through. Yeah, so that's, that's very true. The meter size barrier is a, is a major problem where the grains get to a, a certain size and then drift towards the star. Although our observations have, have sort of indicated that we are still finding these kind of large grains in orbit around their star that haven't drifted in. And they're just, there is a few uh, sort of processes that can stop these large grains from, from drifting inwards. One of them, for example, is a planet can essentially in orbit and can sort of gravitationally interact with these grains and prevent them from drifting inwards is one idea. But this is still quite an active field of research. With the other approach where planets condense directly out of the protoplanetary disk, that helps explain the big planets like Jupiter and Saturn. But does it also explain smaller rocky worlds? Uh, that method doesn't give you a small planet such as the rocky ones that we have in our solar system, which don't have such a large gaseous atmosphere sphere like Jupiter and Saturn. So there needs to be sort of a different formation mechanism for those, which sort of early observations have indicated that there is there's a large reservoir of, of grains quite close to the star, you know, within about five a year around around various stars. We're still sort of limited by instruments at the time. But yes, it, it, we definitely can't form rocky planets through that method. It's only the, the large gaseous one. So that would suggest two different planetary formation methods depending on the size of the planets. How does that tally with what we see in the universe? Uh, roughly. So our exoplanet surveys, such as the ones with Kepler, sort of show that there's a large diversity of planets which is significantly different to our own solar system. We know that we can get rocky planets quite close to the host star. We can get gaseous planets also quite, host, quite close to the host star. But with direct imaging, we've found that we can find planets actually much further away from their star, such as the one where we detect in HD 169, 142. And also observations with radio interferometers have found planets that could be even up to 200 astronomical units from their star this, this was likely sort of just still multiple Jupiter mass planets which really makes you question how did they get there and, and what's possible to happen in the universe and what kind of sort of tapestry of planets is there we originally had one solar system as a model our own when we started looking beyond our solar system and we started discovering other solar systems we very quickly found out that our solar system well it's not typical that must have been a shock. Yeah, that's that's very, very true. So, so far, we've obviously, with transit and radial velocity techniques, we've found that planets can be much closer to their star. Gaseous planets can be much closer to their star. And then in protoplanetary disks, planets can form much, much further away from their star. And it's sort of rewritten what we thought solar systems could look like, which is, which is very exciting. It confirmed the planetary migration model for a start, but also it must raise questions as to whether or not you're seeing gas giants close to stars simply because they're easier to see close to stars. Yeah, so there's two options observational biases there. So with uh, with transit and radial velocity techniques, it's easy to find planets close to their star, whereas with directly imaging them when they're in their formation phase in a protoplanetary disk, it's easier to find these large gaseous planets that are quite far from their star. So these two techniques sort of have their own observational biases, but it's also helped us avoid assuming planets can only form one way or the other or be in one location in their solar system or the other. So they really complement each other. That's Ian Hammond from my- Monash University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Japan fails in its attempt to land on the moon, and later in the science report, growing evidence for the possibility of a new El Nino event in coming months. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Japanese startup iSpace has confirmed that its Hakuru R Mission 1 spacecraft has crashed while attempting to land on the lunar surface. Communications with the tiny probe were lost during the descent phase of the mission. Mission managers say the 340 kilogram lander probably experienced a hard touchdown as it hit the lunar surface. Company says its engineers are now working to determine why the landing failed. That data will be used in the development of the company's next lunar lander, Mission 2, which is still proceeding at this stage and should launch next year. The Hakuto R Mission 1 spacecraft is named after a moon-dwelling white rabbit from Japanese folklore. It was launched on December 11th aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from the United States Space Force Cape Canaveral spaceport in Florida. 
The mission was carrying payloads for several countries, including a 10-kilogram rover developed by the United Arab Emirates. So far, only the United States, the former Soviet Union and China have successfully landed spacecraft on the lunar surface. Back in April 2019, an Israeli lander failed in its attempt, and in 2016, an Indian lander also crashed onto the surface. Currently, two American companies, Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines, are planning their own lunar landing attempts later this year. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has shown that the recent triple-dip La Nina event has overturned conventional wisdom about the causes of multi-year La Nina weather patterns. A report to the European Geosciences Union General Assembly suggests there was an unusual trigger for the weather phenomenon. It had been thought that you first needed a big El Nino event to kick off a multi-year La Nina. But the recent three-year La Nina clearly didn't follow that hypothesis. Instead, meteorologists now think that anomalous warmth from the tropical Indian Atlantic Oceans energised the La Nina and that led to the three-year event. Meanwhile, a new report from NOAA, America's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in other words, the US Weather Bureau, warns there's now a 62% chance of an El Nino event developing within the next few months. And it further forecasts there's an 80% chance of the El Nino developing by the end of September. The warnings are based on new modelling forecasts. But they differ from predictions by Australia's Bureau of Meteorology, which states that the existing El Nino Southern Oscillation Index, or ENSO, data supports only a 50-50% chance of an El Nino developing. The Bureau says the Indian Ocean Dipole is currently neutral, but models suggest that a positive Indian Ocean Dipole could develop in coming months. Now, a positive Indian Ocean Dipole can suppress winter and spring rainfall over much of Australia, and that would potentially exasperate the drying effect of El Nino. The El Nino and La Nina Southern Oscillation Pattern, known as ENSO, is the primary meteorological driver influencing Australia's weather and climate on a year-to-year basis. It's a naturally occurring shift in ocean temperatures and weather patterns along the equatorial Pacific, causing a shift in atmospheric circulation. Now, These weather cycles can operate over timescales ranging from as little as one up to eight years. El Nino meaning little boy or Christ child in Spanish, causes extended periods of warming sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific, with high surface pressures in the tropical western Pacific. The name was first coined by Peruvian fishers in the 1600s. They noticed unusually reduced catches of anchovies during periods of warm water in the Pacific Ocean. Here in Australia, El Niños tend to result in periods of warmer temperatures, reduced rainfall increased drought and high fire danger, while at the same time the Americas tend to experience increased rainfall, even flooding and lots of storm activity, with the Pacific jet stream moving further south, causing drier and warmer conditions in the northern US and Canada, while the US Gulf Coast and southeast become wetter than usual with increased flooding. Typically, the equatorial trade winds blow from east to west across the Pacific during El Niños. Meanwhile, El Nino's counterpart, La Nina, or Little Girl, is associated with low surface pressure and extended periods of cooling sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific. There are also persistent southeasterly to northwesterly winds, strengthening in tropical and equatorial latitudes, with clouds shifting west across the Pacific closer to Australia. La Nina results in increased rainfall and flooding across eastern and central Australia, with more storm and tropical cyclone activity likely. And there's a weakening or even reversal of the prevailing trade winds, pushing more warm water towards Australian shores. La Nina can also lead to a more severe American hurricane season. 
Meanwhile, the colder eastern Pacific waters are pushing the jet stream further north, bringing more drought conditions to the southern US and heavy rains and flooding to the Pacific Northwest and Canada. During a La Nina period, US winter temperatures are usually warmer than normal in the south and cooler than normal in the north. A new study has confirmed that drinking cranberry juice is good for you. The claim has long been a prevention strategy for women who develop urinary tract infections. And the new medical evidence shows that consuming cranberry products is an effective way to prevent a UTI before it gets started. Global studies looking at the benefits of cranberry products published in Cochrane Reviews have now determined that cranberry juice and its supplements do reduce the risk of repeated symptomatic UTIs in women by more than a quarter, in children by more than half, and in people susceptible to UTIs following medical interventions by about 53%. There's a somewhat macabre but yet fascinating article in Literary Hub by Sally D looking at the origins of Frankenstein and the dark ethics of electroshock therapy. Tim Mendham from Strange Skeptic says, The creepy story explains not just the history behind the often gruesome experiments undertaken by Galvani and his nephew, but also what their work would ultimately spawn. Bioelectricity is the stimulation of organic matter by applying electricity, or it's now, the this generation... Is like Galvani and the frog leg. It is, it is exactly Galvani, um, and you know, sort of with the frogs and sticking some wires on and seeing the frog's legs move, or it is creating electricity from a battery of organic matter. Like in the Matrix. Is that the Matrix? Okay, yeah, I'll yeah, take your word for it. I can't remember that. Batteries, yeah. batteries to keep the... At the same going. time, Volt was putting forward his battery theory, creating batteries out of metal plates and things. Galvani was doing that with organic matter and he was sort of pilloried at the time by a lot of people and, you know, who really wants to see frog legs um, squirming? His nephew, who worked with him, took it a lot further. His name was Aldini, Giovanni Aldini, and after Galvani had had, had his day, Aldini carried on and was actually doing it with bigger things than frogs and more impressive. He was doing it with dogs, horses, all sorts of animals, and then, of course, the ultimate was trying to do it on people. It's alive! Um, it's alive! It's alive! Thank you. Club with people is you know, getting a, a people body is not always easy, and getting a fresh people body is even harder. But what they did was they tended to make deals uh, at the time with prisons, etc., that when someone was executed, especially hanging, they could get the body straight away to do um, medical experiments on. And this was sort of quite common, not always official, but quite common for medical schools and things like that. Not just the ones who dug up the graves; those bodies weren't any good. Yeah, you had to have something fresh. Yeah, and started to decay, etc. Right. So you really want something fresh, and you know, something a couple of hours that's old. So then he was adding stimulation and putting wires on all sorts of places, including very private places, and getting the body to squirm, basically, to react. And uh, he used to have groups of scientists all around. He used to do it with the animals and things for high society entertainment, including like royals and people like that. Obviously, he came from Italy, but I mean, he did it in various places. And they were fascinated. Then he started doing it on people, which might have been a bit gruesome for the high society, in scientific context. And people became interested in the idea. And he also was then using the development of electricity he had an experiment with calves' heads, young cows, putting them in series and creating a battery. Attach it to a frog and make the frog move. It was a lot harder the other way. It depends on your source of battery, how high a power charge it was as to what you could then affect. Because it came up with all sorts of theories of woo, etc., of, of uh, energy within the body and the way it affects your health, blah, 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 blah. And that's the trouble with uh, Galvani and Aldini was that a lot of people were hanging on and sort of creating sort of pseudosciences off it. Not that Galvani and things weren't, didn't have an element of pseudoscience anyway. But anyway, it carried on. And then, of course, you, if you realise, if you think about it, that's actually the application of uh, electricity to make a body is, is obviously what happens with defibrillators. You can also, of course, it's also, and then, which is what Aldini was trying to show, is that electrical output is a indication of whether you're alive or dead. And of course, that's also used that when the brain stops working, when there's no sort of activity in the brain, that's often electrical activity, whether it's chemical, electrical, or whatever, is an indication of when someone's dead. So there are applications to what they were working on at the time, even if they were a bit sort of shonky in what they were doing at the time, which it has developed, which is the way science works, a wonderful thing, and that is applied today. So the history of the fall and rise of bioelectricity is what an article is called, because it's mainly looking at Aldini rather than his uncle. His uncle was the rise and fall of bioelectricity. Aldini had took it the other way 
and they added some scientific imprimatur to it, not entirely complete. There was still an element of entertainment and still a lot of dead ends in what he was talking about, but eventually you come down to some stuff that's really quite interesting. That is where Mary Shelley got the idea of Frankenstein from, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, and vitalism was came out of that about the energy within the human body, and it leads on to all sort of pseudosciences and naturopathy and all sort of areas of so that, you know, the vital elements of the body, the energy, Reiki, all sorts of these things, which are definitely pseudo, come out of this idea that the human body has all these energies within it, which either can be stimulated or used as a source, and that leads on. But poor old Aldini got sort of wrapped up in this and got carried away with all the um, woo merchants of this stuff. Well, for a while, he had a lot of scientific credibility. There were galvanic societies opened up all over the place. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 